Copyright, University of South Australia. This recording may contain third-party copyright material. Apart from any use permitted under the Copyright Act 1968, no part of this recording may be reproduced or rebroadcast by any means or process without the prior written permission of the University of South Australia and the copyright owners. Welcome back to the next part on the vertebral column. So now we're going to talk about our thoracic vertebrae. So in our thoracic region, which is our chest region, we have 12 vertebrae. So 12 thoracic vertebrae would then articulate with uh, 12 pairs of ribs and the sternum to make up our thoracic cage. But if we're talking about the vertebrae to begin with, this is a really good region to study the typical features of a vertebrae. So if we have a look at this bone here, which is a typical thoracic vertebra, it has all of the classic features which you would expect to find in any typical vertebrae. So here we have its vertebral body, here then its vertebral foramen, these two small arms passing backwards are the pedicle, then we have superior and inferior articular facets which would then go with the bone above and the bone below like previously described. This structure passing out to the side is the transverse process. Here this area between the transverse process and the spinous process is the lamina and then obviously the spinous process on most of the back. So we have the anterior part which is the body and the posterior part which is forming this arch. All right, So the anterior and the posterior arches effectively. Now if we talk about how these develop embryologically, the body grows, then in the transverse and the spinous processes, these areas also have bony growth areas too. So all four parts of this come together and form your vertebrae as you're developing. So congenital malformations which might occur, and especially in the lumbar region, is when the um, growth area within the spinous process does not meet and fuse with those within the transverse processes. And this is how you would get spina bifida, all right, which is primarily common in the lumbar region, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So if we talk about typical and atypical vertebrae once again, the thoracic region is quite interesting. All right, so some vertebrae which are atypical within the um, thoracic, some books describe that it is T1 to T4 and then also T9 to T12, which are atypical. Now, let's try and talk about why that might be the case. So we just previously talked about the cervical vertebrae. So here, if we have that C7, what we can actually see, what we need to imagine is that when it comes to then articulate with T1, now we've had a region change. So we've gone from the cervical region to the thoracic region. Now you're looking at this one here and you're seeing that it looks pretty similar. And you're right, the major difference that we can see is that the cervical vertebrae, as we talked about previously, have these transverse foramina and T1 does not. So what's gonna make your thoracic vertebrae, T1, different from your cervical vertebrae in C7 is obviously that there is no transverse foramina, but then we also gain these articular aspects on the lateral aspect. So here and here, we can see this depressed area here and a small depressed area here on the vertebral body. And this is actually for articulation of the ribs. So obviously we know that our thoracic vertebrae articulate with our ribs and it's not very common it was obviously it's not common for the, the seventh cervical vertebrae to have one, but sometimes um, there can be a small fibrous one. So now when you see here, when these two come together, they need to match, right? Now in the cervical vertebrae, we talked about the articular facets and how that they were more oblique, running on a bit of an angle, right? Whereas here in the thoracic, what's typical is that they are vertical in their orientation, all right? So based on that, in order to go from somewhat more horizontal and oblique to vertical and in the coronal plane, we need to have a transition. So anytime we transition from one segment to another, we're going to have atypical vertebrae. So atypical vertebrae is definitely T1.
right? And then this would vary as it goes through, but generally described as T1 to T4 being atypical because they are slightly more cervical in how they look. Another feature which is really important to look at when you're talking about thoracic vertebrae is the spinous process. And you can see how this here is directed inferiorly, it points downwards. Whereas if we come back up to T1 here, you can see that it's more horizontal in its orientation. All right, so obviously that makes them atypical of one another. Now, the typical features then, if we talk about these being the most important, Typical features are that we have a heart shape body or an arrowhead shaped body that we can see here, a vertebral foramen which is circular, vertical and frontal facing articular facets. And we have these articulations on the body and the transverse process for the ribs. So costo meaning rib and vertebral being vertebrae, costo vertebral facets. And its spinous process points downwards. Right, so these are the typical features. So if you're ever asked to describe a typical thoracic vertebrae, this is how you would do that. Now it's interesting also to note that some other atypical vertebrae beyond that, as we said earlier, are then T9 to 12. Now once again, as we talked um, before, as you then come down towards the lumbar vertebrae, these would need to then change. So here I've got a, a T12, all right, and so you can see here and compared to the one that we had earlier, which would be about T5 or T6, you can see that it looks very different. Right, so the body's become a little bit bigger in comparison to the ones from above. The spinous process has become very short and is now going horizontal. But then what we've also got here is that the superior articular facet is in the orientation for the thoracic vertebrae, but the inferior articular facet here is facing in the way that the lumbar would. And we'll show you how that works a little bit later. Another thing that you can also see is that there are no transverse processes, all right, when compared to this one. And then the articulation for the rib is here, all right, on the pedicle rather than on the body here, all right. So let's have a go at labeling a thoracic vertebrae. So you can either just draw along as we have in the past or then find another one which has been a picture off Google or something like that would be totally fine, all right. So let's drawing in all the features. All right, so if we remember, we talked about coloring in blue for articular sites and then brown for the rest of the bone. So let's do that. So this area here, the blue part on the vertebral body, if you remember, that was a fibrocartilaginous or secondary cartilaginous type joint. Then these articular facets here, the superior articular facets on the vertebrae, these are for the Z joints or those plain synovial type joints. But then this one here, this one here, and then these two out here, these are those costovertebral articulations. So they're there for articulation for the ribs. Now it's interesting, each um, vertebrae actually has two ribs which come in contact with it on its upper part of its body and its lower part of its body as well, all right? So we won't expect you to know or understand how this articulation occurs at this point in time, but just to know if we bring two bones together here like this, what we would have is we would have the rib with its head and its tubercle here. What actually happens is when we've got the two vertebrae together like this, the head would come with the body, there like this, all right? And the tubercle comes with the transverse process. So this is how the rib would articulate with the vertebrae. And this is going to allow different types of motions, um, which are important for inhalation 
and exhalation. So let's label this. So here we have the body, which we know is heart shaped, so specifically for the thoracic vertebrae. This one is a costal facet. And then so was this one. So these two are costal facets. This part here, the vertebral foramen. Then here, the pedicle, the transverse process, the lamina, and the spinous process. Here, and finally, the superior articular facet. And we'll talk about the motions now. Now, because they're in the coronal plane, you need to imagine that they're gliding on each other like this. So if you've got two structures which are gliding upon each other in the coronal plane, then the motions that we're going to have occur are going to be rotation. So you can see that they're gliding on each other like that. So most of the rotation that you get actually comes out of your thoracic region. So about uh, 65 to 90 degrees of the rotation that you get comes out of your thoracic and then also from the back you would have some lateral flexion so that's like bending over to pick up your bag off the ground or something like this okay so the motions then where in the cervical we had three motions we've only got two now in the thoracic region all right so which are rotation left and right and then lateral flexion Alright, very good, and we'll speak to you again soon with part 3 and the lumbar vertebrae.